Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So in continuation of our summer farm tour series today, we are once again hanging out with Yoko and Alex of Osawaga Farm in Connecticut, discussing this time how they maximize their small farm and all the great things from their marketing to their ability to employ more people uh, and take more time off that have changed and improved as a result of thinking small. If you enjoy this video or any of our videos, consider supporting our work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook, where we dive deep into some of the technical details on things like cover cropping. And when you pick it up from notillgrowers.com, the proceeds go to things like sending my partner at notillgrowers.com, Jackson Roulette, up to film some of the best no-till farms in the country and share that with you, just like this. So check that out. Otherwise, enough from me. Let's get to it with Yoko and Alex of Osawaga Farm. <laughs> so I'm Yoko Takamura. I'm Alex Carpenter. And we own and operate Asawaga Farm in East Putnam, Connecticut. Yeah, we're very seasonal. So we intentionally take the winters off because farming is hard and uh, we need to reset at the end of the season. And we also, I like to go back to Japan every winter. That's where most of my family is. Uh, and we like to travel too. So being able to get off the farm for weeks is kind of important to us and so we start the season uh, selling things in mid-May. We start off with a big plant sale and then, you know, with a trickle of fresh vegetables and then we ramp up the vegetables um, by June. And we go to one farmer's market in Boston, which is about an hour away, and we have a on-site farm stand um, weekly as well. And so those two go up until Thanksgiving and that's kind of basically our hard cutoff. Yeah, we don't do much wholesale either. We have a friend who's a chef who owns a restaurant in Worcester, which is about uh, 30 minutes away. And so we'll sell him stuff when we have leftovers. But um, the Brookline market is a monster and we move most of our stuff there. Um, we, we move almost everything we grow um, besides eating it and giving some to employees. But um, yeah, our marketing outlets are pretty tight. Pretty, yeah, tight and very simple. We like to keep our marketing the sales outlets um, as minimal as possible and not trying to sell to, you know, a wide range of customers. So mm -hmm. it's, it's nice and our schedule is very easy. We're actually, we're actually changing our farm stand from Sundays to Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were hanging out with our employees after hours and one of them was like, why aren't you doing the farm stand on Saturdays? And we actually couldn't come up with one reason why we do it on a Sunday. So we're gonna switch it to Saturdays in the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. And that should actually bring in even more people to the farm stand. Um, and the farm stand, we see it as uh, a, a place where we can um, grow more and more. Obviously we don't have to haul it anywhere. Uh, we can grow a few more um, non-vegetable things like perennials and fruits and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we feel like there's more potential in the farm stand, whereas the farmer's market that we go to in Boston, we're maxing out our van mostly mm -hmm. already. So we bought a whole new set of bins actually to be able to pack more things in it. Um, so we're hoping we can bring more to the market, but um, yeah, there's that limit of how much we can pack in the van. So that's kind of the restriction. That was a uh, that was a change that came with COVID. And I think for a lot of people, that farm store model probably came with COVID too. You know, we know a lot of folks who their, their uh, marketing model was selling to a lot of chefs and then that dried up real fast once COVID hit. Um, for us, we were doing two big markets up in Boston. And uh, as soon as COVID hit, one of them pivoted and, and um, they listened to the farmers. They, they did a real good job in adapting to the new rules and regulations. We're in Boston, so things really clamped down. Um, but that market just stayed steady. And the other one, they just didn't know what to do and they freaked out and it kind of fell apart for a while. Another thing is, um, we were doing two markets up in Boston. We were moving everything that we grew. And then we'd have local folks saying, where can we get your vegetables? And we're like, oh, it's you can drive an hour, but that didn't feel good, right? We want to feed our local community too. Uh, so we started doing a couple pop-ups and that's why we started doing it on Sunday because that market we transferred out of was a Saturday. So we were like, all right, we'll just do this pop-up. And then when we transitioned, we just never thought about that day again. And so for the past few years, we've just been doing Sundays. Um, but yeah, like Yoko said, it works out really well because we, we live right above the farm stand. We live in a barn. Um, we just walk downstairs, we set it up, people come to us, and we've built a really cool community 
um, out of that. And, and like she was saying too, it really seems like it has unlimited potential. It's just uh, how hard we want to hit it. And I think that yeah. moving it to the Saturday is really going to unlock that too. Um, yeah, so to your point about, you know, seeing other farms switch to that farm stand model and you see them bringing in way more products from outside, right? So um, that's an option. But for us, I don't think we'll ever go in that direction um, because that's like a whole nother business. It's you know, you're buying and reselling and you have to keep track of, you know, everything you have, their expiration dates, and it uh, adds complexity to everything. At the end of the day, I don't want to have to watch over other people's stuff and then be able to have to get a cooler or a freezer or whatever to display their products. Um, and, you know, as I said, we have a hard cutoff and after Thanksgiving, I don't want to be left with a bunch of products and mm -hmm. it's just a whole nother business. And it's, it's also like, okay, so you are bringing in more people and more money if you have those outside products, but at the same time, how much more is that costing you? So to us, it's like, okay, we might not have as many people come to us, but we're also, it's just our vegetables. You know, we do actually have vendors come and sell at our farm stand. So we have meat and eggs and things like that. But again, that's just a farmer coming up, coming to the farm stand, setting up their, um, their stand and selling it. So uh, we do have more products than just vegetables, but that's kind of the extent that we're gonna, you know, go to with the farm stand. And it's, it's perfectly fine. And, and also the hours, it's really quite short for us. It's just once a week for three hours. So it is, a lot like just going to a farmer's market, setting up and selling. And to us, that's the best way to deliver the most freshest vegetables and not have to have crazy cooler displays and constantly restocking. So we like to just have like a short span where people come and I know it doesn't work for everybody, but there's a farmer's market in town. It's not for everybody and they have options. So um, it's been working out for us. And I think moving to the Saturday market, it's going to be even bigger. So what we're producing, it's a good amount for the farmer's market and the farm stand. So we don't need it to be any bigger than that, really. And we didn't mention it earlier, but we don't have any plans to expand. Um, the high tunnel that we're going to build, hopefully this fall, was something that just, it just came up in the last couple of weeks, honestly. Up until then, we were pretty adamant that we're like never going to um, put another tunnel. We only have that one greenhouse. Um, it's a 72 by 30 mm -hmm. and we love growing outdoors and we really haven't felt like the need really to have to grow, um, build another high tunnel. Um, but this spring has just been so unusual. It's been really cool. The nights have been really cold. Things are growing really slowly. Mm -hmm. And so this spring has been that first kind of like not wake up call, but kind of our, I felt like we needed to rethink a little yeah. bit. Well, no, we need to have more control, especially over the spring things. Uh, every year is so extreme now. It's crazy. Uh, three years ago was a historic drought. Two years ago, it rained every day over the summer. Last year, it didn't rain for like three, three and a half months. This year, it's cloudy every day and we're in a drought. Um, we've got the fire, the smoke drifting down from Canada. Um, we're still like 72 degrees during the day. This time last year, we had two to three times as much stuff coming out of the fields. Yeah. So just to have that controlled space, it was a direction we didn't want to go in, but you have to adapt. And uh, God knows what next spring is going to be like in the following spring. I mean, I don't think farmers need to be told like the benefits of a high tunnel. Yeah. Everybody knows that things grow really well. But it's like, more about just your... being open to change and like never yeah. say never because we're right. like, we're not going to get any bigger. And then we're like, oh, <laughs> we kind of well, have to. <laughs> but I do want to send the message that we've been perfectly doing great with just one um, indoor structure and growing everything outside. I, we grow all the way up until Thanksgiving. Um, we, you know, double, triple cover if we need to, but things grow. We have plenty of things up until the, un unless we have a crazy early frost that's really a September cold. polar vortex. Yeah, and we've had that before. Everything. Yeah, no, it does. But um, usually so we can provide till the end. It's nice to try to, you know, rein a little bit more control over things. But I think we we've been telling ourselves, we, we're kind of the outlier in terms of 
indoor growing space. We obviously have very little indoor growing space, but we still, you know, make a living off of this and it's en enough to hire three full-time employees. And I just don't want farmers that are just beginning to think, oh, we got to like build all these tunnels. There's like a lot of money to be made just from outdoor growing too. Of course, there's a lot more things you got to deal with, um, you know, whether it be putting row cover on or dealing with more disease and insects. But I personally really like growing outside mm -hmm. and I'd rather be working outside. So yeah, I mean, Yoko's right. We, our first season, we were half this size. We just had three fields. We have six fields now. The second year we had six fields and it's been that way ever since. And uh, just by focusing on the efficiency, um, we've been able to be more profitable every year and grow it, hire more people. Um, I think a lot of times, yeah, people just view like we have to get bigger, we have to get bigger, we have to grow more. But then you start losing the ability to to see everything on the farm and, and really focus on the quality over quantity, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, for us, it, it's, I mean, you know, with the, the people that are on the podcast, a lot are small growers and it's incredible the amount of food that you can produce. Just, we don't use a tractor in here, so it's all really, really tight spacing. Um, but we're less than an acre and we're putting out more than some of the bigger farms that are at the uh, farmer's market with us. Uh, so yeah, really just like, dial it in and focus on everything and then use that mentality to start to grow. I think that's kind of where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know how many people get into farming with the idea of being a manager. Like it's, it's a totally different skill set. It's, um, we actually, uh, had the mentality that, oh, we're, we're, we've got this small space. We don't ever need employees. We can handle it. The two of us, but, uh, it's not like we're getting any younger and things aren't getting any easier as far as like climate and, uh, on the unpredictable things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's been, a, it's been a steep learning curve. As far as when we decided we needed employees, uh, I think it just got to the point where, you know, when it's, when it's in the real crazy time of the season and it's just the two of us doing everything, there were times when we couldn't, we didn't have the time or the energy to harvest everything that needed to be mm -hmm. harvested. And we were just leaving money on the table. Um, so, then we started to open our mind to, all right, well, maybe we can bring in a couple part-timers, right? Um, so we did that our, our fourth year. We hired two part-timers. Um, one of them didn't work out. One of them did. She stayed till the end of the season. And we saw the potential of if we have the right person with the right attitude and we mesh well, um, we can get so much more done just even with one part-timer, you know? Yeah, those first few employees totally pay for themselves. I mean, mm -hmm. you get much more production out of having those extra set of hands. Mm -hmm. So you're not even, you shouldn't even think of it as a cost, you know? Um, and then the next year we were like, all right, well, maybe it'd be nice to have a full-timer. So we hired a full-timer and a part-timer. And uh, unfortunately, neither of them made it till the end of the season um, for powers out of our control. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people romanticize farming and then they get into it and they realize that it's really hard work and it doesn't stop. We have to be out here in the rain. We have to be out here in the cold and the heat. But with that, the one full-timer, I mean, that was like really opened our eyes to mm -hmm. how much we could get done, you know? And that last year was our best growing season ever. It was a drought, but you know, we're no-till, we mulch everything. So we weren't too worried about that. It's just the, the production and the amount we could bring to market, the work we could get done was awesome. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then this year we just dove right in and, and we hired three full timers. Well, our calculation was we need about two, two and a half, two and a half people, but three full time is just perfect because then it, it actually ends up being about two and a half people because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they take days off and yeah. So it works out that way. And, and another aspect of that too, it's like, yeah, we could stay on this piece of land for the next 20, 30 years, just doing what we do and never really share that with anyone. And it's not like we, it's not like we have everything figured out. It's total opposite actually, <laughs> um, with the amount of things we've changed from year to year. But it, it, I think it is important to disseminate this to people and for people who are interested in it, to bring them in and show them what we're doing. And you know, we value their input too. It's not like we're just telling them how to do things. Like they've made suggestions and we're like, oh, like even just yeah. changing the farm stand day, like that was crazy, um, but growing too. So so it is important to uh, to share this knowledge and kind of, uh, we, we want young farmers to know that it's possible to do this for a living, 
to be full time. Like it, farming can be an attractive option. It should be. We need more farmers. Mm -hmm. We dabbled in, you know, like intercropping and um, things like that, but that definitely doesn't walkways. translate well to employees <laughs> because yeah. once you have like lettuce planting here and then lettuce planting over there next to the whatever, uh, that's just really just too complex for employees. So over the years, obviously you have a better idea of what to plant, how much to plant, what varieties to plant. Obviously we've simplified the varieties too to make it easier on employees. But just, yeah, every kind of square foot of the farm is productive, you know, once you start dialing it in. So, yeah, another thing about having employees is you get to have that time to um, get to those things that you wouldn't otherwise, right? It's like, oh, if we had thrown insect netting on that bed, we could have gotten like an entire bed of cabbage mm -hmm. or something. We did a, a small CSA our first couple of years. That's that's something that changed too. When we did the initial podcast, we were still doing a small CSA. Oh, and yeah. uh, after that second season, we, we stopped and we just did purely market gardening. Um, and to us, we're, we're market farmers, you know, it's nice to take what you have, like a spring like this, we're taking way less than we did last year, but we don't owe anybody anything. And we have beautiful what we have, yeah. and we sell it all. And that's great. You know, we'll bring more next week. Yeah. It's not like, oh, we got to set aside this much. And yeah. we've already spent that money. And it was a little stressful. So. Yeah. Yeah, and every year we get emails from, you know, young farmers in the area and they're looking to buy, oh, this didn't grow well for us. We need to buy a couple hundred pounds of carrots to make our CSA. And we've sold, when we had extra lettuce, we sold it to a farm so they could use it for CSA. I don't, I don't want that, that hustle in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Sure. I mean, the biggest thing on my mind is employee management and yeah, the last two years that we had employees, it was, um, there's definitely a skill to being a good manager. So we're constantly looking at ourselves and assessing ourselves. Like, are we giving out good instructions or are we, you know, giving them enough space? And mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of reflection there. But what we're running into this year is we really expanded the crew to three full timers and they're all new this year. So it's definitely new challenges this year because in the past employees would just follow us around and do what we were doing and uh, what's fun about farming when you're working for somebody is to have some independence and be able to have responsibilities and look um, start a process from start to finish on your own so we do want to provide that kind of um, experience for our employees and so We've had to have a hard look at our systems because what worked for us really well um, until last year, it just doesn't work anymore. Like like we talked about the fertilizer, we used to mix, you know, different portions of um, fertilizer and that's just not practical anymore. So just little things like that where, you know, it comes to us intuitively. Like for instance, we just kind of look at our bed when we're prepping the bed and just make sure it's straight. <laughs> And it's so easy to say that. And to us, it's just second nature. It's like, yep, and we don't have to mark the beds or anything. Um, and then it's just really hard for a new person to know what's straight or to fix it if it's not straight. Yeah, we're thinking maybe we need to start marking our beds so it's much easier to define where the edges of the beds are. So things like that, we just have to rethink. Um, cover cropping just is a bit more of a challenge too. Just everything just takes a bit longer. Um, so for something that isn't directly tied to sales, it's hard to be like, okay, we're spending like half the day on cover cropping, you know? So yeah. that's what we're dealing with this year. I think that's the biggest, the biggest ongoing challenge is just uh, making it work in such a way that you can continue to do it for as long as possible. Um, some of the things, you know, you have to walk this line and you have to make compromises. It's like we take our soil health into account with everything we do. And it, you know, it, it creates challenges and it slows us down on some things and it makes it hard to translate to someone who's new and coming in. Um, so just streamlining our systems. Um, we, we have this <laughs> tendency to uh, experiment with things every year. Uh, every year has been something different and just trying to distill everything down to like the best possible 
compromise that you can make so that looking out in the future where you want to be and how you're getting there and how those systems are going to be uh, presented to people and yeah it's, it's just a massive undertaking i think this is this year like Yoko was saying that's it's a huge challenge is just to like figure out what we're doing and like where we're going and how that is practical and at the end of the day this is a business and how we're we're able to afford to do it and afford to bring people in and uh yeah mm -hmm. all that stuff it's that's the biggest challenge i think with farming growing stuff like the stuff's gonna grow um it's dealing with the people dealing with the business and feeling yeah. good about it at the end of the day yeah, yeah. I, we hear from other growers too. I think employee, I mean, finding employees is definitely a challenge mm -hmm. nowadays. And then retaining employees is, I think, one of the you know, big topics that are discussed um, amongst farmers nowadays. And then, yeah, we were talking to a friend of ours, a farmer friend of ours, just the other night. And she, yeah, she was like, you know, it takes a full year for <clears throat> it to click <laughs> for employees. So, you know, you don't, it's just it's a long time you don't really get the benefit of uh the full benefit of an employee until they stay on for a period of time so mm -hmm. it's it's an investment and sometimes it's it's hard to go through that period of you know we're going to be slower than you they're not going to be done as thoroughly as you and so it, it's it's hard but it, that's something that we have to yeah. get used to as well and year two those weren't conversations or thoughts that we were even having so we didn't even think we would ever have employees you know so that's a huge change. And, and one of the things I think that's nice and that shows progress is the fact that we have dialed in our systems to the point that we can think about that stuff. We're not just always scrambling to keep everything going, you know? So now we can step back, we can bring more people in. And just like we try to focus on the efficiency of our crops, we can start focusing on the efficiency of the business and making it something that will hopefully outlive us you know hopefully people will be growing on this land when we're done with it mm -hmm. and, and hopefully it's someone that was involved with the farm while we were here you know? mm -hmm. yeah i mean i'm sure a lot of farmers start off thinking oh we can we can do this ourselves but then it's like you're gonna want to take some weekends off sometimes you know and like you're gonna want to go to your friend's weddings and like yeah so in order for you to have work-life balance i mean you're probably going to have somebody come and help you, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then you need that skill to be a good manager. So. Huge thank you to Yoko and Alex and to Jackson who filmed and edited it. Uh, make sure to check out the other videos we did with these two, which you can find on our channel. Don't forget to support our work. You can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch or just go to patreon.com slash notillgrowers and sign up or you can hit that super thanks button. That works too. This support that you all literally do every week makes it possible for us to make these videos. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.